Chapter 12 And as always we start off with an excerpt from Dr. Chen's notes. There was the great flood. At the time Thunderbird fought with Mimlos' whale. The battle lasted a long time. For a long time the battle was undecided. Thunderbird in the air could not whip Mimlos' whale in the water. Thunderbird would seize Mimlos' whale in his talons and try to carry Mimlos' whale to his nest in the mountains. Mimlos' whale would get away. Again Thunderwood, Thunderbird would seize him. Again Mimlos' whale would escape. The battle between them was terrible. The noises that Thunderbird made when he flapped his wings shook the mountains. They stripped the timber there. They tore the trees out by their roots. Then Mimlos Whale got away again. Thunderbird caught Mimlos Whale ag again. They fought a terrible battle in another place. All the trees there were torn out by their roots. Again, Mimlos Whale escaped. Many times they fought. Thus each time Thunderbird caught Mimlos Whale, there was a terrible battle, and all the trees in that place were uprooted. At last Mimlos Whale escaped to the deep ocean, and Thunderbird gave up the fight. That is why the killer whale still lives in the ocean today, in those places where Thunderbird and Mimlos Whale fought. To this day, no trees grow. Those places are the prairies on the Olympic Peninsula. And that comes from the legend of the Hoch and the Quile people of the Pacific Northwest. And that's told by Luke Hobucket, circa 1933. By the time Mark and Coleman got back to the bridge, the Argo had begun to move again, flying up and away from the fight. It was clear Godzilla was in his element now, worrying Monster Zero like a crocodile, rolling him, trying to keep all three heads under at once. Twenty seconds to impact, Stanton said. Impact? Mark wondered. What did we miss? Coleman asked. Suddenly, a dragon head hurled towards the windshield. It's more gaping at them, and Mark realized they weren't out of range yet. But then Godzilla yanked Monster Zero back down, and the Argo began to haul some serious ass. Oh, Coleman gasped. The military just launched a weapon that's about to kill them both, Stanton said. Mark glanced at Serizawa, whose brow was deeply furrowed. Someone way above his pay grade must have made this call. Serizawa would never willingly allow his favorite monster to get blasted, and despite himself, Mark felt the stirring of sympathy for Serizawa's point of view. Godzilla had saved their lives a couple of times now, whether he meant to or not, but if the big lizard had to die for them to get Monster Zero 2, it's not the worst idea, Mark said. On the other hand, Godzilla was winning. Monster Zero was taking way more than he was dishing out, his golden lightning flickering while Godzilla had never looked stronger. The two monsters dwindled as the Argo tore away, but there was plenty of cameras on the action as Godzilla grabbed one of Monster Zero's heads and bit it off. A spray of black blood jetted from the stump. It looked almost like petroleum. That had to hurt, even if you have a couple of spares. Mark found he was looking forward to what Godzilla would do next. A flicker of silver entered his peripheral vision. A plane? He blinked involuntarily as both monsters were engulfed in light. The flash was brief, a brilliant green, and it quickly mushroomed into the atmosphere, casting a Charchus pale over the sea. As the flash faded, the cloud lifted higher. He saw the titans were no longer locked in battle. They were thrashing about in the water, gasping for something out of reach, fighting something they couldn't claw or bite. They were sinking. Still flailing, both titans vanished beneath the waves. Mark had been praying for this moment for five years, for Godzilla's death, justice for his son and all the others who had died in the monster's trans-global rampage. But somehow, now that the moment was here, he wasn't as elated as he thought he would be. He realized he didn't just have sympathy for Sir Zhao's view, he was beginning to believe him. 
and if Serizawa was right, what they'd just done could be a big mistake. Rodan was still out there, and Mofra, and plenty more where they came from. The sea, still not entirely settled from the fight, began to stir and foam. Bubbles broke the surface as if some undersea gas cavity had opened up. Thousands of silvery slivers appeared, spreading on the surface. Fish, he realized, as the sea began to darken and glow red, and the bubbling increased, became a fountain, a spray. Monster Zero exploded from the blood-red sea, now a two-headed dragon, but most certainly not dead. His wings cracked the air as he broke free of the ocean and soared aloft. Mark feared that he would turn back to them, but instead he flapped off towards land. Apparently the loss of a head meant it was time to call it a day. The sea quietened back down, settled into its accustomed swells. Serizawa kept staring, but if he was hoping the big lizard was going to come back up, it seemed he was going to be disappointed. Dr. Stanton, Serizawa finally said, can you locate Godzilla? Stanton began scanning. Yeah, he said, I've got something. He turned up the volume, and once again they heard the thudding of the huge reptile's heart, but not like before. This time it was much weaker, less steady. His vitals are fading, Stanton said. Radiation levels plummeting. The radioactive aura of the tracking screen was dwindling. The heartbeat continued to weaken. What the hell had they hit him with? And why had Monster Zero been able to handle it so much better? Come on, big guy, Stanton murmured. Fight it! No, Serzawa said. He looked stricken. Godzilla's heart beat once more. The aura faded. Mark kept waiting for the next beat. Any second now it would start again, but it didn't. The telemetry displayed only flatline signatures. He's gone, Stanton said. Sarazawa was trembling. He looked broken. All of them, everyone in the room looked like, what? Like they had lost a loved one? Or was it just that none of them believed that a, the big lizard could die? Looks like you got your wish, Mark, Serizawa said softly. It was true, but he took no pleasure in it. He'd wanted revenge for a long time. Now he just wanted his daughter back. Matteo was sleeping, which Mariana found incredible, but she was grateful for it. He had seen too much today, just as she had. The soldiers had found quarters for them on their big airplane, some food and drink. It wasn't good, but she was happy to have it, as she was happy to be alive. How is he doing? The man sitting next to her asked, indicating Matteo. She knew him a little bit, the cousin of one of her high school friends. Once in a while, he would appear for mass. He was a net maker and sometimes went out with the fisherman, Antonio. As well as any of us, she said. What do you imagine will happen next, Antonio said. She shrugged. The soldier named Barnes said we are going to a monarch base. From there we'll, we'll be repatriated. To where, he said. A poor island. She shook her head. I don't know, she said. I don't know if I could take Matteo back there anyway. I've never been to the mainland, Antonio said. I wouldn't know how to live there. It's not over yet, Marina said. By the time it is, there may be no place left for us anywhere. Now we cut to Jebel Bakal in Sudan. The pilgrims grumbled about being denied access to the site, and so did the local government. But Nez broadened the perimeter to include the tomb and place it off limits to visitors. And for a while, nothing happened, except that they got a little more information about who carried out the attack on the Yunnan outpost. Nez finally relaxed enough to have a beer in the cantina during one of her rare off-duty hours. It was a good thing she only had one, because an hour later she was called back to duty. Another base had been attacked, and another Titan released. In Antarctica. A little later, they were called to view a video of Dr. Emma Russell, whose mind had clearly slipped crooked. 
taking credit for the release and making it clear, she meant to set even more monsters free. The colonel was off in Washington, so Kearns turned to her. Master Sergeant, part of your role here is to advise, Kearns said. I know you've been increasing security, but... Kill it, she said without hesitation. Excuse me? The monster, she replied. I've seen the kill switch. Use it. Kearns, Eshmael, and the others stared at her. That's not an option, Kearns said. At least not at this point. It's the only way to make sure it doesn't get loose, sir. Freer takes me for a fool, Kearns said. I hope you don't. I'm well aware that the government is trying to make the case to execute the creatures, trying to find any excuse. Mr. Kearns, she broke in. Two monsters are already loose on the world, and the crazy doctor just told us she's going to break out as many as possible. That is not an excuse to kill Moloke. It's a mandate. Three, Ishmael said. What? Kearns asked. Mexico, he said, just came in. La Isla de Mata, the demon's nest. On one of the monitors, a volcano was erupting, but it wasn't just lava, smoke, and ash coming out. A titan was spreading fiery wings. It looked like it was made of lava itself. Rodan, Lang said. Be damned, she fought. That's Tse Ninahalich, the rock m monster eagle. Now can we kill it? she asked. This site will not be compromised, Kern said. Mokole Mbembe will remain contained and unharmed. You make sure of that. It's why you're here. She sighed, but then she began giving orders. Move the helicopters and drone patrols out to ten clicks, she said. If a mouse moves out there, I want to know about it. When Monster Zero flew off, he had a destination in mind. Drones tracked him to Isla de Mata, where beneath a steady darkening sky, he settled into Rodin's flaming nest. It looked to Mark like a classic case of asserting dominance. He was not only taking Rodin's territory, but also his very seat of power, a usurper sitting on the old king's throne. And yet, that was odd behavior for a... Wounded animal. They usually return to somewhere they consider safe, or at least familiar, and there could be little doubt Monster Zero was badly hurt. Once in the nest, he began writhing and screeching in pain. Maybe, hopefully, the loss of a head was a fatal blow. But like a decapitated snake, Monster Zero was taking his time realizing he was dead. Sitting in the lava seemed to make things even worse for the big fella, which was a shame. Had he made a fatal mistake climbing in Rodan's throne? Was he now too wounded to fly out again? But then Mark noticed something. It wasn't just the necks that still had heads that were squirming like earthworms on a hot sidewalk. The headless neck was too. It was no longer grouting blood. And in fact, the severing wound wasn't there anymore either. In fact, something appeared to be emerging from the stump. No. He had read it all completely wrong. Monster Zero wasn't pissing on Rodan's territory, and he wasn't dying. He'd come to the demon's nest for the lava, the radiation moving up from beneath the earth, searching for the nourishment he needed to regrow his freaking head. Like a goddamn hydra from Greek mythology, it was covered in some sort of slimy membrane, but one of the other heads reached over and bit it off so the baby head could keep forming. In moments, the new head was fully grown, blinking newly formed eyes, just as full of malevolence as the others. At least, Mark thought, it only grew back one. Hydras were supposed to grow two for every one you took off. But three was still three too many. Monster Zero opened his trio of razor-filled mouths and screamed at the heavens. To Mark, it didn't seem like merely a scream of triumph. It was something else, a challenge maybe, or a call.